2013's Evil Dead review and thoughts. Happy Spooktober! We are closing off the quadrilogy with this video. I have covered every single official Evil Dead movie. So I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely love. This video will have some jokes, none at the expense of the members of minorities, and I will get into some serious topics. If you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today, and or it's different from the trilogy of Evil Dead movies, so it sucks. Whether you agree with those assessment or not, this is not that review. And, yeah, throughout this video, when I say the word trilogy, I'm talking about Evil Dead, you know, 1981's Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, and Army of Darkness. I realize this video is long. I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review where if I spoil anything, which I'm almost definitely not going to do, but I will verbally warn before I do so, hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip it until you see me lower my index finger. And let's see. Yes, and as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this movie and the trilogy. I will not be spoiling Evil Dead Rise in this video, at least not without warning. And uh, yeah, if you want to see me talk about other Evil Dead, official Evil Dead things, the there is a dedicated playlist in the description box. But but yeah, including uh, included in the spoilers, once I get into the spoiler sections, I will be talking in detail about the endings of these four movies. The top link in the description box will enable you to donate to the SAG After Strikers, and then there's some links to the videos to help explain why this is such an important strike. And yeah, so this movie is rated R, and it is very much a hard R. You know, in case you watched Army of Darkness and you felt like, ah, you know, it's not quite as hardcore as the first two Evil Dead movies. Yeah, this one's this one heads back into in in that direction and goes really really far, much further than the you know. There's more gore and violence in this one movie than the first two Evil Dead movies combined. So yeah, um, gonna be briefly quoting from the IMDb Parents Guide: Sex and nudity are mild, but violence and gore. Profanity and frightening and intense scenes are severe. And yeah, alcohol, drugs, and smoking is also mild. Though I'm not entirely sure why... Okay, I, I would... I feel like at least one of the things is, goes beyond mild. But anyway, the yeah, definitely agree with the severe ratings. Um, the profanity thing, I, I will just briefly talk about. So... I am not like prudish with anything. Uh, I it doesn't bother me, you know. Go fucking nuts. Say whatever motherfucking word you want. I don't give a shit, cocksucker. But I do think some of the swearing in this one feels like it's just there to appeal to young people presumed to like swearing. There's one bit that, like, approaches, I wouldn't say it gets there, but approaches, like, Rob Zombie Halloween 2 levels, and you never want to go there, of of just, like, swearing just for the sake of it. I, In my opinion, it doesn't have to be, but I think it can be very useful for swearing to communicate something about the character, about their state of mind, maybe about the relationship between certain people. Like, if one character swears a lot with his friends, but not with his girlfriend, or vice versa, you know, that can really help inform. And and that's also, you know, I'm not saying there's something wrong with... It's it's completely relative, you know. the I, th I think you try to talk to people the way that you feel like they want to be talked to, uh, you know, unless they're conservative and you're trying to shame them, but other than that, you know, and yeah, there's a couple of parts in this. There's also, there's one part where someone says freaking and then right after says fucking, and it's like, I, were you like, just 
copy pasting swears in and you missed one is just anyway i d i d wouldn't say that it's excessive but i can understand if some people feel i i would say that some of the swearing in this just feels like it doesn't really it doesn't add i don't know if i would go so far as to say it detracts but i definitely don't think that it it adds it feels like it's just like trying to to you know be as as harsh as as possible with the language and i don't think it was really yeah and let's see. yeah and and under frightening and intense scenes one person put much darker and scarier than the original and that brings us so yeah, um, I am basing this review on the theatrical, not the unrated, um, the, the extended slash unrated cut runs an hour and 36 minutes and adds several extra shots, as well as a new scene, and yeah, it aired on TV and is available on Blu-ray, that is not the version I have access to, I, I'd like to watch it, but yeah. Uh, and this is my third viewing. I, I only got the DVD about half a year ago when Evil Dead Rise came out. I made sure to that I had copies of all the, the films. That was the first time I ever watched it. Uh, I've wanted to watch it since 2013. I, I don't know. I just didn't really feel like there was much of a reason to, I guess. Um, yeah, and it's also, you know, when it came out, I heard people say... This is yet another bad horror movie remake, so I was like, okay, I don't need to watch more of those, and yeah, I, I kind of wish that I, I had watched it back then. I completely disagree that it's a bad horror movie remake. So the, the plot, I'm going to quote IMDb's synopsis here, five friends head to a remote cabin where the discovery of a Book of the Dead leads them to unwittingly summon up demons living in the nearby woods. And that brings us to... So this was written by Fede Alvarez, as well as... Oh, hold on. That was the wrong thing to click. There we go. Rodo Sayagas. And, uh, yeah, it's... Sam Raimi gets a writing credit because it's based on his Evil Dead. Feta Alvarez also directs. And I am not particularly familiar with their other work. I mean, Feta Alvarez also wrote the screenplay for The Girl in the Spider's Web, which, you know, I thought was was fine. It wasn't amazing. And he's he's apparently... Yeah, he, he wrote Alien Romulus, which is currently in post-production and uh, let's see yeah and and um Fede Alvarez and Rodo Sayagas have written uh let's see yeah, yeah together they wrote El Coyonudo that's probably Cojonudo I guess um Don't Breathe 1 and 2 and the 2022 Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and oh right, and and uh, a TV series called Calls, which I gotta say sounds interesting. Um, told through a series of interconnected phone conversations, it chronicles a mystery story. Let's see, yeah, I think uh, I don't know if the rest of that synopsis is, has spoilers, but. Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd be willing to watch it. Um, Apple Plus. Yeah, I don't think I have that one. Um, but yeah, and... Uh, let's see... Yeah, that's about what they... Let's, yeah, that's, that's about... Right, uh, yeah. Panic Attack, they also wrote together, which is the only other thing that Fede has directed that I've seen. It's, let's see, last I checked, it was on YouTube. I forgot to check. I'll, I'll check real, real quick. 
I watched it half a year ago, so it could be. Let's see. Uh, hmm. Okay, a, I am not really finding it. Um. Yes, right, right. It's uh, yeah on on um, YouTube. It uh, here on YouTube. It is under its original Spanish title, "Attack de Panico." Um, but but if you if you do a search for "Panic Attack" short film Fed Alvarez, yeah, it will appear. And yeah, you know, being a, a short film, it's not illegal to watch on YouTube. But yeah, um, other than that, yeah, uh, yeah, so he directed, oh, he directed all nine episodes of Coles, he directed the first Don't Breathe, he directed an episode of From Dust Till Dawn, the series, El Cojonudo, um, El Ultimo Alevara, and Los Potillos, and those last three are short films. I mean, Don't Breathe also sounds interesting, you know, basically it's this thing of, you know, some some young people in, in the house of a blind man who, oh, that's right, and Jane Levy is in that one as well, she's also in this one, so they like working together, evidently, um, and am I saying that right? Uh, no, no, never mind. Yeah, uh, the, she appears to be the only actress who's in both of these. But yeah, and it's it's got Stephen Lang, who I quite liked in, in Avatar. So yeah, I, I would like to watch that. I, um, let's see, do I have access? Is it on a service that I am... I don't currently have access to it, but yeah, the the um, I can't really compare the the writing and directing very much, but it does appear that they are a good writing duo. Uh, you know, they they pretty much everything in in this movie has been thought of in in one way or another. And, um, yeah, I don't really mind Fede's direction in The Girl in the Spider's Web. Mo most of my problems with that movie are, like, the script and, let's see, I don't think he had anything. Oh, no, never mind. Yeah, he did help write the script, but he was writing with two other people, Jay Basu and Stephen Knight, and that was also more of a product, uh, you know, with, with this, it was more like, okay, you know, he loves the original movie, he wants to do it justice, uh, you know, Sam Raimi is on board, and yeah, Girl in the Spider's Web, you know, the studio wanted another millennium film, another, uh, you know, ah, what's her name again, it, another Lisbeth Salander film. And let's see. Yes, so according to Wikipedia, initially Lily Collins was scheduled to play Mia. And yeah, um, I have only seen Lily Collins in a movie I know some people really hate Mirror Mirror from 2012. I hold that movie in fairly high regard, but I understand why some people don't. So I don't really know, you know. I don't. I don't know enough to say if she would have done a, a good job. Um, they're they're relatively similar looking, so I, I it might have just been like based on on that. Now. Let's see. 
yeah, um, Alvarez, who has a background in CGI, also confirmed in an interview that the film does not employ CGI except for touch-ups. We didn't do any CGI in the movie. Everything that you will see is real, which was really demanding. This was a very long shoot, 70 days of shooting at night. There's a reason people use CG. It's cheaper and faster. I hate that. We researched a lot of magic tricks and illusion tricks. And, yeah, um, it absolutely... I'm, I'm really glad they made that decision. That was obviously, that was one of the big things that we were all worried about when we heard they're remaking Evil Dead in the 2010s. It's like, oh my fucking god, it's going to be completely packed with CG and, and just complete... Like, there's stuff in the Nightmare on Elm Street remake where it's like, why did you do that in CG? They did that same effect in the 80s and it looked much better it didn't look it didn't have this plastic you know kind of kind of um yeah the the too 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 clean too too like sheen to it because it was you know a practical effect back then and uh, let's see, yeah, Fed Alvarez and uh, Roto Sayagas co wrote the script, which was then doctored by Diablo Cody in an effort to Americanize the dialogue since English was not the writer's first language. And I think that was a, a very wise decision. Uh, you know, the, the, um, yeah. And, and it is, you know, uh, it's, it's not as aggressively like teen speak as what I hear about Juno and what I know from watching I can't believe I'm blanking on the name hold on um, I'll have it momentarily Je Jennifer's body that's it you know I love Jennifer's body including the the use of language I understand some people don't I definitely don't think it would have worked well for this movie and yeah I'm really glad that you know and I think that was the the sort of the the directive she was given you know don't go as far which also you know a lot of people didn't like that movie it bombed so they weren't the the studio did not want her to to go as far with that one and that was also more of like a passion project this was very much a, a touch up and yeah uh let's see it does feel like it is the way that young people speak more or less and yeah, the, the film was produced by Ramey Campbell and Robert G. Tappert, who are the producers of the original trilogy. Ramey and Campbell had planned a remake for many years, but in 2009, Campbell stated the proposed remake was going nowhere, had fizzled due to extremely negative fan reaction. Now, Evil Dead 2 has ten times the budget of the film before it. Army of Darkness has about four times of, yeah, of Evil Dead 2. And that is about where the budget stays for these, you know, yeah, for, for the last couple of entries. Maybe only, if not accounting for inflation, I'm not entirely certain. And this fact can really help you appreciate how slick and polished this one is, also considering that this and Evil Dead Rise are not as big productions in scope as Army of Darkness. So, you know, the, the Army of Darkness has the, the sort of very... It feels more professional, but it's still, it is like the little movie that could, where this and Evil Dead Rise, you know, they are Hollywood productions. They, they're, they're Hollywood productions that appreciate how dark a lot of us want these movies to be, but they are, you know, a bit more slick. And I can understand why some people really, really hate that. It doesn't bother me personally, but it is a thing. It's definitely something you notice watching these. I recommend reading the IMDb Frequently Asked Questions and Trivia. And, yeah, so other than this movie, ranked worst to best, and I do love all of them, you know, 1981's Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness, and Evil Dead Rise. And this movie very wisely doesn't try to out-Raimi Sam Raimi 
at all. No one wants watered down Sam Raimi. It would be a huge mistake for this to try to just directly emulate his style instead of taking inspiration from it. Similar to how Raimi doesn't just try to make a Hitchcock movie with these very non Hitchcock things in the trilogy, he takes some elements from Hitchcock the tension, suspense, the way everything is set up and paid off, the morbid sense of humor, you know, it's it's not quite like the way that some of Brian De Palma movie, Palma's movies kind of feel like, okay, you just kind of want to be making Hitchcock movies, don't you? To the point where Hitchcock literally sued him because, you know, the, De Palma, big fan of a lot of your work, if you're going to make movies that similar to another director you might not want to do it while they're still alive. You know, that's kind of a thing that, you know, a lot a lot of artists are very protective of their work. But yeah, these movies, you know, actually, I have no idea if... Uh, hold on. When was it that... Let's see. Hitchcock. Let's see. He... Oh, that's right. Yeah, he did... He died in 1980, so he would not have been able to watch the original Evil Dead so it's you know it's impossible to know exactly what he would have thought but i can certainly imagine that you know some of his some of the very last movies he made were much more explicit in sexuality and violence so i can imagine he might have been able to appreciate some of that but yeah and you know i'm not making any excuses for hitchcock the person he did some really awful things to some of the people he was working with now, uh, let's see, yes, yeah, so, one thing, uh, you know, this definitely does, one of, the, one of the really defining traits of the trilogy is this very kinetic, hyper-kinetic camera work, and this movie, a lot of the time, that would not quite have worked as well, uh, you know, it, it creates a very specific tone in the trilogy, and that was not the tone they were going for here, which, again, is something that some people really took issue with, and I get that. Um, there is some hyperkinetic camera work in this, and you can very much tell, you know, this was not made by people who don't really like the, the original, you know, which some of these things, it's like, okay... Number one, you probably didn't watch the original that you're doing a remake of. Number two, if you did, you did not understand it at all. Number three, I really don't get the sense that you particularly respect. Like, I'd like for every remake to be made with love. Sometimes you can't get that. Respect, I feel like, is a bare minimum. I don't think it's a problem to change things. But the thing I always say when you go against something, you should understand why is that thing the rule or why is it a trope why did they do that before? Don't just break rules just because you feel like it. You know, I, I think most things should change over time. I, there's very, very little that we should just keep going the same way we have been. You know, eventually you realize, oh, there's a better way. You know, and maybe that way wouldn't always have worked. Maybe new technology is around that means that we can do this differently. But... Yeah, if you don't understand why it used to be that way, you might end up making a mistake that you could have avoided if you made sure you understood the original thing. And but but yeah, there are some some shots that are very very clearly inspired by by Raimi's work on the trilogy and the you have this you know, on, uh, on more than one occasion in this movie, they will use handheld, which was, of course, much less of a thing. And, you know, there's, technically speaking, some of it is handheld in the trilogy because of, you know, the, like, budget limitations and such. But a lot of it, they, they couldn't really have done, and it wasn't really, like, some movies were made with handheld back then. You know, you have... I, I, I'm not 100% certain it's the first, but I know that certainly they used handheld cinematography as far back as the first French Connection, which is from, I want to say, 72 or something like that. So, you know, but that was also a very different thing. But around this time, you know, yeah, people were using handheld 
in horror movies because handheld, when it's done right, can really put you right in the moment. And I, I think it was a very smart decision to, to go with that, to add this slightly other texture. And for those people who really don't like handheld, it's not a huge um, amount of the movie, and there's a lot of classic cinematography. And, yeah, so, like anything that is at least partially inspired by H.P. Lovecraft and demonizes non-Christian belief systems, this, uh, let's see, this is unfortunately somewhat racist. Honestly, it easily could have been about Christianity, since it features, you know, Christianity features one of the most famous zombies in Jesus, but I can appreciate that the movie didn't want to enrage the Christians who, let's be honest, look for any excuse to be offended by about their religion and its depiction in media, as if there are not countless pieces of media that have positive, even propagandistic depiction of it. But the reason for their being supernatural evil didn't need to be, well, supernatural. Could have, it could easily have been at least somewhat, although fairly dubious, science, based on science like the original Night of the Living Dead, a movie that the original Evil Dead from 1981 does take inspiration from in other respects. And I appreciate that some people would say, well, you know, it's supposed to be the same demons from the the trilogy so it has to be like some kind of supernatural thing i honestly think it would have been very compelling if they had just straight up said oh no this is not you know yeah yeah the like the guy who who translated this book before clearly thought it was like this old you know sumerian thing no it was it's based on christianity you know it's it's I, I think that would have been, you know, much more interesting. And as I've mentioned in each of these videos, I think this is a franchise that just got better and better, started really strong. So when I say really positive things about this movie in this video, please keep in mind, don't, you know, please keep that in mind. Don't take it as me saying that the older ones suck because this one is so great. Like, normally I am deeply unimpressed by horror from the late 2000s and early 2010s. Not only the remakes, though. Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, Invasion, yikes, just so terrible. Friday the 13th was fine, like all the other ones in that series. Very few horror remakes are actually good. Like, 1986 The, the Fly and 1982 The Thing might be, like, yeah, those and this are probably the only three, like, if you have, you know, other suggestions for, for really solid horror remakes, please put them in the comments. Uh, you know, I'm always looking for new horror. You know, so I'm really, really relieved that this movie is so great. And I think it does some things that you can do today in horror that you really couldn't in the 80s and 90s, and that's part of why I'm so glad that we got it, that movies are still being made in this franchise so long after it started and had its glory days. And I really appreciate that the characters in this movie have problems before the movie starts. It's not airheaded young people just going to party. They're actually going there to solve a problem. They didn't go to the middle of nowhere to party randomly, which I do maintain is a satirical aspect of the, the first two. You know, but, but it's the kind of thing that you don't need to keep doing. Like, it's, it's pretty important that it's young people and that at least most of them have some kind of pre-existing relationship with at least one other person there. It's just not the same if they're just complete strangers. But, no, I, I really appreciate this, you know, I, I don't think we need more horror movies where some of the main characters are, like, partying young people. I, I think it's much more interesting to do something different. But, yeah, you know, like, if yeah, you know, when when the first movie came out, if it had been like you know they're they're going to this cabin, they have problems. Like people wouldn't have thought, oh horror. They would have been like, oh, God fucking damn it! Did someone trick me into watching a goddamn drama? You know, which is not what you want when you sit down and watch a horror movie. But by this point, you know, by 2013, yeah, you know, horror movies can start with people having problems. And let's. See. The, um, yeah, and the, the interpersonal relationships are deeper, and this is one of the recent horror movies that acknowledges sadness can be closely tied to fear. It isn't always, but it can be, and that can deepen horror. The satire is gone, and I completely understand people who are very frustrated with that. You know, the, the tone... 
you know, some some people have pointed to the fact that the first, the the original Evil Dead was also darker and less less light, less funny than you know, Evil Dead Two and Army of Darkness. This is darker than even the original Evil Dead, and yeah. You know, keep in mind, Sam Raimi was producer on this. You know, if he if he saw them taking it in this direction, and he was like, what are you doing? You can't... No, it's not Evil Dead anymore. No, it... it you know, he would have... He, you know, he had say in it. And as far as I understand, he was fairly happy with how this movie turned out. Now... Let's see. It, it's perfectly all right that there are people who do not like this movie. Honestly, if you think it's the worst movie ever made, you're completely entitled to that opinion. And I'm definitely not calling for anyone to be silenced here. I do wish that the people who deep down just were not willing to consider this movie as anything other than an insult by its very existence, just put that in their user reviews. I mean, for some of them, it definitely shows. You know, I, having watched the movie, can tell... They're just lying. They're misrepresenting it, you know. But if I read those reviews before watching it, I might not have watched it, and that kind of bugs me. I love this movie. I think it's one of the best in the entire movie series. Some people hate it. I could see a case made for the truth being somewhere in between those. There's probably a Goldilocks zone somewhere. I'm not telling you that you're wrong if you don't like this movie. I just, I, you know, I'm not even saying that you can't exaggerate. Or, you know, like, if you want to write, uh, you know, back when I started out on YouTube, I can imagine, like, you know, I may well have said some things that were very exaggerated. I, I'd like to think that I always tried to make sure it was clear this is exaggeration, you know, but, yeah, I'm not saying that you can't exaggerate in your reviews. Just make sure that it's completely clear to whoever is reading or watching. So, let's see. The... Um, I think... I want to talk about that in the spoiler section. So, I will just briefly copy it in. And while I'm doing that, um... So there's a thing in this where a character says, yeah, um, by this point, we know how it goes. Someone has to read the incantation in the book in order to, the, the yeah, for the, for the demons to, to, you know, become as, as powerful, you know, essentially they're in slumber, someone needs to, to you know, nudge them and be like, you're going to be late for demon school, you know, the, you don't want to miss it, today's the day when, you know, you get to, to learn how to make a head spin 360 degrees, you're going to look a fool to everyone else in class if you're the only person who doesn't, this is, this is pea soup vomiting day, come on man. Obviously, you need a character to, you know, in, in some of these, it's the, you know, reading, it's, it's saying the words. In some, it's like, oh, there's a recording of someone saying the words. In this movie, someone reads aloud the words, and I appreciate that it was necessary to do that. It was necessary to get a character in this to say the words. I don't think they made the right choice in who said the words, because I, I don't think I want to give away exactly who does do it, but they're established to be smart, and they ignore the warning. Like, you know, this is it's not the exact same book as in the, the other movies. There are, there are warnings in English, you know, to, to not not say the words, not hear the words, and the thing is, there's another character, like, they they go to this cabin specifically to help Mia, 
as played by Jane Levy, Levy uh, to to you know they want to help her basically quit drugs cold turkey, and early on they say she might try to hurt herself. We have to you know be very we we have to make sure that she's not able to have her read it, you know have her see the warnings in the book and read it in order to, to make the situation worse so they'll be forced to, to take her back to, to the city. You know, it's it's such an easy, you know, you don't even have to change much. Like, obviously you couldn't re-edit it to this point, but I feel like this is something you should have realized as you were writing it, you know, knowing, okay, we're gonna go very gritty, realistic, harsh, you know, one of the reasons that it works in the other movies is that it is this heightened thing. It's this kind of, you know, ridiculous kind of thing. So, so yeah, people do really stupid shit in those movies, and we're okay with it because it fits the tone. But here, it just feels very... Yeah, it, it feels like it's like, well, I mean, we, can, we gotta have someone read it, you know. And, yeah, in, in general, this definitely does have some really stupid decisions made so that the movie can happen the way they wanted it to maximize the horror. And it would, of course, be great if the movie could have avoided those or they came from character... The, the, yeah. If it came from the character of a character, like, which tended to be the case in the trilogy. There's some really stupid mistakes made there, but, you know, like, literally, in the first movie, you know... Scotty is the one who's like, "Ooh, let's listen to this weird recording," and you know, one of the, one of the women are like, "No, I don't want to," you know, and he's like, acting like it's like a, a prank or something, like, just you know, I get that he doesn't know he's in a horror movie, but it really is like, it's just yeah, you know, never forget Scotty from Evil Dead One, moron, douche, dick. But yeah, this movie has gritty themes and plot points like other horror from around the same time as it came out. And yeah, um, this is the first time, first in the, the series where the characters did not go to the cabin in order to just relax, spend positive time together. We also learned very early in the film the last people, or yeah, some people who stayed in the cabin before were not there doing research. You know, when this came out, there was an expectation that the leads in this kind of thing were not just partying young people. Now, director and co-writer Fede Alvarez is from Uruguay in South America. He brings that kind of sensibility to this. A willingness to, willingness to, in art, embrace strong emotions, physical drives, and violence and gore in a way that repressed American white people often do not. You know, and, and for sure, Sam Raimi already was going against the the repression but like Fed Alvarez was never really you know he wasn't I suppose there's there's a certain repression there there is everywhere that Christianity reigns supreme but there is a yeah it's 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 not quite the the same and that comes through in the movie some people would say this movie starts slow. I don't think it wastes any time. Like, the, the very early stuff is setting up the, the basic, like, yeah, establishing setting, establishing characters. Once again, these are more complex characters than the ones of the, the first, the, of the trilogy. So, yeah, it, it takes a, a little bit of time, and it's also this idea of if you... You know, if you start, if, if you know, if you hit the ground running, then you can't really. There's not so much of a of a contrast between when it's safe and when it's just you know going nuts. And yeah, you know, like the trilogy, most of this is the movie just going nuts. And I, I don't think it spends much more time you know, before getting to, like, possession and such, than the the first movie. The second one does go pretty quickly into it, you know, and, and the third one 
also, yeah, but the, the, you know, the, the first one, like, if you, if you think back to it, like, for sure, it has, like, the, the camera work, editing, and, like, sound design from right away are very creepy and scary in a way that this movie does not attempt to emulate. But the, the first possession doesn't happen, like, immediately. And this movie is much more upsetting and emotional than the trilogy, yeah, all three parts of the trilogy combined. The demonic taunts cut bone deep and will break your heart. Like, just holy shit. And, uh, yeah, we care about the characters. They feel like real people. The only hammy acting is from Possessed. And... I think this is my second favorite score of the, the first four. Like, overall, Army of Darkness is superior. I love how aggressive the score is here, matching the gore, or at least seeking to, you know, at, at least one point they use air raid sirens, which reminded me of the even better score from the original Silent Hill game. The first time I watched this movie, The Evil Dead Remake, helped me remember how much I love the genre of horror and watching horror that I hadn't watched before. That was why I decided to start watching at least one new horror thing every week, not only once per month, which I had been. That's when I started watching a weekly episode of a horror show on Disney+, Plus, starting with Scream Queens, which, you know, if I recall, I was already interested in doing, but I wasn't planning on diving into it as soon as I did. And, yeah, this ha this movie has even less humor than the movie that it's remaking, which, of course, is a good thing to some, a bad thing to others. People expected more humor from this movie franchise when this came out. With the hammy acting gone, you know, we get more dramatic performances. They're all solid. The gore feels real, not ridiculous like the trilogy. And, again, I acknowledge that is part of the appeal of the trilogy, is how ridiculous it is. And, yeah, some people have said, oh, the characters aren't likable. I agree. They're interesting, which I consider to be the better way to go. And, yeah, this is one of the only torture porn movies that I like. Like, this sinister... I think an argument could be made for Mum and Dad, the... the ah, crap. Is it Australian or British? Some, something like that, you know. Um, yeah, some people would definitely say that movie is... Yeah the, the, yeah, the 2008 movie written and directed by Stephen Scheil, if that's how you pronounce that. You know, I love that movie. That Yeah, these are probably the only three. Oh, usually I'm not into torture porn. You know, it's fine if you are. And yeah, at least one person said you shouldn't remake classics because people won't give them a chance, which, you know, I... I I can appreciate that. I think it's something that we need to try to change. But I really respect that that's actually, like, that's an actual argument. You know, the, yeah. Yeah, and, and one person points out the, right, um, yes. So, going to be quoting reviews here. I think most of these are user reviews, but some are critics. The tone of the film also feels a little conflicted. Definitely tries to take a more serious, straight horror approach for much of its duration, but additionally sprinkles in comedic elements reminiscent of the original. These two approaches don't complement each other that well and feel slightly at odds. That is absolutely true. You know, I, I love that there are a lot of references to the trilogy, but some of them definitely, like, th they really don't fit with the with the, the tone and yeah one person makes the case the concept and events are entirely too ridiculous to play so straight and that is absolutely yeah a, a very strong case could could be made for that and uh yeah one person said you know this was released after elevated horror came back but it is not itself elevated horror which might be a mistake there might have been an expectation let's see and yeah our one person that alvarez triumphs because he made one crucial decision avoid digital animation and use only practical 
in-camera special effects. He uses every trick from classic Hollywood and invents a few of his own. Right, and one person says, and and it's, I just I wish they had just said that it's their own opinion, but I, you know, basically he says horror movies aren't supposed to scare you; they're supposed to horrify you. They play on your primal fears and cause negative emotions to arise as a result. Being scared has nothing to do with how good a horror movie is. I respect his opinion. I I disagree. Most of all, I just wish that he hadn't made it out to be the the that it's that it's just factual. Like in my opinion, horror movies can do both of these things. And and this is definitely a movie that is trying to to play on primal fears. But I would definitely say this movie is also trying to to scare. In the, yeah. Let's see, and yeah, one person says the film is beautifully shot. Brilliant visuals, not only in the effects and makeup, but in the superb lighting of its cinematography. The insistent music score is also amazing, and the sound design adds immeasurably to the scare quotient. And then we get to some... Uh, okay. I try not to make this a big part of my videos, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna run through these quickly. One user review expressed wanting the director torture and execute in Gitmo. Dude, you're making the rest of us horror fans look bad. Seek help. And the same thing for the one who said critics aren't people. And the one who said, I hate life when this is a movie that exists. Like nobody's forcing you to watch it. Just Yeah. And I feel silly for even expressing this in serious manner, but just in case someone is watching who needs to hear the following, please do not write or say stuff like that. You get the same thing across without crossing a line saying something like, this made me angry, or, you know, see, I have been angry for, more, more angry than I have been in a very long time, and I wish they had made it. And, not, and I'm not reading stuff on 4chan or Reddit, that kind of thing, in part specifically to avoid reading heinous crap like that. No, I'm not saying all of Reddit is like that. You know, some of these are IMDb user reviews, and those are unfortunately not as curated as in a number of cases they really ought to be. You know, YMS found a review of 28 weeks later that urged people to hate the movie, who hate the movie to consider suicide, absolutely crossing the line. And, and then, oh my god, okay, this one fucking guy, or girl, wrote, This is not a remake, it does not reference the original. Look, you're obviously free to think whatever you want of the quality of this movie. If you think it's the worst movie ever made, you're entirely entitled to that opinion. But it is simply completely absurd to claim that it doesn't reference the first movie when it's filled to the brim with references. Maybe you don't like the references, but they're there. And I would argue they feel loving, not half-hearted. Don't spread misinformation, especially online. Same thing goes for the people claiming this has less gore than the original. I don't... Th if you seriously believe that, you don't know what gore is. Like, I don't know, maybe you just watched Evil Dead 2 and you heard that people praise the gore and you think that gore means horror comedy or something? I don't know. Because that th there isn't very much comedy in this movie. And yeah, one person says, only gore and violence, no suspense. I wish those who made that claim would explain what suspense means to them, because it is simply not the definition that I and many others go by. The, the dictionary definition of suspense, yeah, I have no clue what they mean, how they miss all the suspense that it has. And that is technically a spoiler, so I'm just going to move that into the spoiler section. There we go. And, yeah, uh, one person said, you know, more than one person said the cast are too conventionally attractive. I think they went for that in the trilogies, just, you know, budget limitations and standards have changed. Now, let's see. I, I do appreciate the, the argument that, you know, some of these look, like, perfectly made up, even in, like... You know, situations where it feels like, okay, there's no way the makeup is, is still perfect. That I do uh, agree with. And that is not something that is in the trilogy. 
I've seen some some say that the acting is bad, the characterization is thinly sketched. I guess forgetting that those are true of the trilogy, and I think it's kind of silly to claim that those traits are anywhere near as bad as they are in the trilogy. Like, I'll grant that Bruce Campbell is charismatic and entertaining, much more so than anyone in this movie, but to say that his performance is good rather than fun, especially compared to the cast in this, it's just plain silly. Like, I'll, I'll grant that certainly some of the characters in this, it's it's fairly straightforward what the the you know what their character is what the what they care about and that kind of thing but it's much more interesting than it was in in the trilogy you know those are not really movies you go to for interesting characters now the some people really hate the opening of this film and i i can understand why and it definitely is like i think the the opening gives you a very quick idea of if you're gonna like the rest of this like if you're watching it either by yourself or with you know with people who don't care if you're not gonna keep watching it yeah if the if the first several minutes just really put you off I, f I mean I would overall say you should probably give it about half an hour but if the opening really puts you off yeah and I th you know you you may want to stop watching and I think that was intentional. I, I feel like the movie's very distinctly sending a signal of what the, the movie's going to be like. And, uh, yeah, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits what came before. I love the ending of this. Uh, I've seen some critics, you know, some, some negative user reviews said that they didn't really care. Others did like it. Um, I guess technically, I don't know if I, technically there is something at the very end of the credits of, of this, at least some versions, of, at least the theatrical. And yeah, some, some people really loved it, some people didn't. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm fine on it. I don't think it needed to be there, but, you know, some people really wanted it there, including some of the people working on the movie. And that brings us to the characters. So, yeah, I've already talked some about Mia. All I'll add to what I've already said is that she, there's a reason for her, the, the pain that drove her into, into drug addiction. It's not a movie that says, oh, you know, it's just weak people who don't, you know, no, it, it absolutely has a, a clear, like, I don't know if I want to give it away. I'll just say that there's some trauma there that, that led to it. And, uh, yeah, her brother, David, played by Shiloh Fernandez, hasn't been around all that much, which, you know, has made him somewhat unpopular with the others, but, you know, he's here now, he's gonna do his best, and you, you know, there's very much this, like, protective older brother energy coming from him, you know, and, um, yeah, Jessica Lucas plays Olivia, and she is a registered nurse, and, yeah, one of the, a member of the, the friend group, and she's gonna, you know, she's in part there to, to help make sure that Mia's, you know, yeah, you know, it, when you, when you try to quit cold turkey, it is good to have someone around who has, like, medical training. You know, there's, there's things that could happen that, that would require Eric, played by Lou Taylor Pucci, is a high school teacher, and yeah, he's you know he's there to to try to help Mia. He is not a big fan of David. He is very much frustrated with with David. And then we have Elizabeth Blackmore, who plays Natalie, David's. I'm not. I think girlfriend, I, I am not 100% certain if it's more than, than girlfriend. And 
I would perhaps say she does not have as much character as, you know, um, yeah, um, she had more dialogue originally, but it ended up not, you know, it didn't end up in the, in the final cut. I forget if they took it out of the script before filming or if they filmed and then just edited it out, but yeah, she, there's not a, a ton there. All of these are very, very talented and really sell the, the character. And it, it helps that the, you know, there's some, some dialogue that really gets across the, the sort of the situation and their, their feelings. And yeah, so there, uh, the, the dialogue, there are 43 entries in the IMDb memorable quote section. All of them are good. And yeah, you know, the, the, um, there is some arguing and, even, and, and bickering and that sort of thing. I felt like it came naturally from like situations and character relationships. Like, you know, it's not a huge surprise that eventually someone really snaps at David, you know, letting loose all the pent-up frustration, you know, I, th I think that's where dialogue can really be useful to, to get across, you know, it's getting to them. This this bad situation is, is breaking down the unity of the group. You know, it doesn't feel like it's just, which, you know, sadly, some people in their reviews felt like it didn't really distinguish itself from just obnoxious bickering, which, you know, there's, yeah, uh, watch any Friday the 13th movie and you'll see some very obnoxious, pointless bickering, which again, you know, for, there there are some people who think that that's what young people want to see in, in movies. I have never felt that way, and I know many who don't, um, yeah, I don't think, Yes, I, I believe I've made my entire case and argument. Now, yes, so this, let's see, there we go. So this was filmed in Auckland, New Zealand. The, the, let's see, yeah, this, the, uh, the Woodhill Forest and you know that's that's where the the cabin is and yeah they do a really great job you know it's it's this thing of like it's not necessarily somewhere you would love to be it's it's this thing of the cabin used to be in better shape it belonged to the the family of of David and, and Mia and you know, it's been a while since anyone was there, since, since anyone in the friend group was there. And, yeah, it, it doesn't look fantastic anymore. And in part also because of, like, weather conditions and such, the forest itself is nice and, and creepy. You know, they, they get a lot out of the, the location shooting. And... That... Brings us to yeah. So this this movie is the the theatrical cut is eighty two minutes without end credits and eighty seven and a half with end credits. And yeah, uh, I don't think there's any boring part of the movie. And I yeah, I really really appreciate that they did make sure to establish everyone's personality because you like you could easily see like a a quick rewrite and this does hit the ground running you know but yeah it's like hypothetically you could have had like oh the demons are loose from the very start these a couple of kids are you know just got to get to this this cabin you know maybe Let's see. Yeah, hypothetically, something has already gone wrong with the the cold turkey attempt. They gotta get, you know, they gotta get Mia inside. They find the cabin. They go in, 
and the demonic possession follows shortly thereafter, you know. I, I really appreciate that we, you know, this is one of those movies that makes you care about the characters and then puts at least some of them through hell. And, yeah, so the the best elements, you know, the yeah, the fact that it brings this 2010's grittiness to the the franchise, the the intense gore and and blood, the 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 acting, how you know compelling the the characters are, you know, and yeah, just the the really really messed up stuff that that happens. The worst aspect, um, I do not think it was strictly necessary to go back to the cabin for a third time in a franchise that at the time was only four movies long. You know, I kind of hope that in the future they take a page out of the book, not the Necronomicon, the book of Army of Darkness and Evil Dead Rise, and go to different places and or time periods. Uh, you know, I'm really, really glad that other than that, you know, again, I don't blame the Evil Dead 2, I, I, I don't think it's bad that that movie exists, and I don't blame Raimi for making another cabin-centric movie. You know, that was, there wasn't a budget for the, the time travel, the Army of Darkness stuff, but making this also set in the cabin, I don't think was necessary. It, you know, the the um, it's not like they only even had oh you know where else are you gonna you know what are you gonna do if you want like cabin you know centric horror well you know 2002 saw cabin fever 2009 saw cabin fever 2 you know there is a cabin fever 3 but that was 2014 so that was after this came out and then Right, 2016, holy crap, how many of these fucking things did they make? Like, from what I hear, even the first one isn't good. I'm, I'm not sure I'm ever going to watch an Eli Roth movie. I really don't find what I've heard about his movies appealing. And the, the clips I've seen, you know, Phalus has covered several of them, and they just really don't appear to be my kind of thing. Anyway, I'm not saying it's wrong to like him, but he's just not for me. Yeah, so so um, something I, I found several user reviews say was you know really really bad about the movie was the fact that it's fairly polished and that goes against the appeal of the trilogy and yeah um, that absolutely you know one hundred percent valid I do not disagree I am of the opinion that you have to keep reinventing. As long as, like, essentially what I would say is, if you're not going to reinvent Evil Dead, then you shouldn't be making more movies. You know, I, I didn't, don't, you know, I haven't read the comics, I haven't played the games. I can imagine in those it keeps being, you know, you the kind of thing you love in a video game or a comic book can last much longer than movies, in, in my experience. Again, you're free to disagree. I don't think it would be interesting to make another Evil Dead movie after the first two without changing something really major. You know, the second one has a lot of appeal in part because it's a bigger version of the first one. If it was just roughly the same as the first, it really wouldn't have, you know, made as big of a pop culture impact as it has. And, and this movie, you know, it's not... It's not necessarily bigger than the the first movie it's just it's harsher grittier and more polished and i 100 percent understand why some people think that that is a bad thing you know i've already made it clear that i don't but yeah because i i think n enough change the thing i was most worried about was that it would be as bad as almost all of the other remakes of horror classics from this time period and yeah, it absolutely was, and I'm really relieved. You know, this and, you know, Scream 4 are perhaps the, the only good horror remakes from this time. And Scream 4, not 
quite a remake. You know, it's more of a soft reboot, but nobody was calling stuff soft reboots back then, I, I don't think. You know, that was more of a thing. Was, was Star Wars uh, Force Awakens? I, I don't know of a soft reboot before that one. I'm Maybe it is the the first one. And let's see. Yeah, the you know the thing I was most looking forward to was a new voice to bring life to a film franchise that wasn't really going anywhere at the time. You know, would I have loved for this movie, you know, instead of you know, instead of doing a remake of the first movie, would I have preferred a movie that follows up on the director's cut ending? Of Army of Darkness? Hell fucking yes. 100%. But, you know, I'm not sure that anyone is daring enough to to actually, like, an of official version of, of that. You know, I, I, I'm not sure I, I really see it. It would be amazing, but, you know, Army of Darkness itself was already too far away from the first two movies for, for many people. Now, the trailers do give too much away, but also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. Um, the trailer kind of makes it look like Mia only ever whispers. It's really just for, for certain scenes in the actual film. The cover and poster do not give too much away, and also give you a pretty decent idea of what the movie is like, and are, you know the covers and posters are worth looking up on IMDb. Now, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 63% from critics, which is based on 206 reviews, 130 of them fresh. The average rating 6.20 out of 10. 64% audience score based on over 50,000 ratings. An average rating of 3.6 out of 5. So these are not like bold over kind of reactions that are more like, you know, yeah, overall, I guess it was pretty good. And the consensus, it may lack the absurd humor that underlined the original, but the new look Evil Dead compensates with brutal terror, gory scares, and gleefully bloody violence. On Metacritic, it has a 57 based, uh, you know, out of 100, mixed or average, based on 38 reviews. 47% positive, 45% mixed, 8% negative, and let's see, yeah, it's, yeah, several of the, the most negative reviews are these, you know, they, they say it's too, it goes too far. Which, you know, that's the kind of thing, like, if I had watched this in 2013, and these are reviews from 2013, maybe I would have felt that way. Um, let's see. You know, a lot of, a lot of horror movies, we, we realize how good they are after, you know, a while after they, they come out. Now, the user reviews have given it a 7.3 out of 10, generally favorable, 72 positive, 18% mixed, and 9% negative. And let's see if we look at the most negative. Wow. Okay, so yeah, one person says that, you know, something in this movie reminded him too much of Asian horror. And he writes, Asian communist horror. You know that some of those movies are Japanese, right? Japan, not communist. Amazing, because he specifically says the ring, which is Japanese, not Chinese. Just fuck me. American education system. Now that's horror. And uh, 
yeah, one of the really negative ones is the, you know, one of the ones that's, oh, you know, it's not even like the original. It doesn't even follow it. So what's the point? And, yeah, then you got a couple that don't even actually say what's bad about it. It just says, oh, it's disappointing. Uh, struggle to get past the halfway mark. Just watch the trilogy again. Just you know, that's it's not a review. It's a reaction. It's not a review. You're not telling me what's bad about it. You're just saying you didn't like it. And yeah, a lot of the a lot of the most negative reviews are pretty worthless. Just have nothing to say. Don't explain what's bad about it. Most of the things that I found in those reviews that I did think made at least some sense, I have already talked about earlier in this video, and some of them I will talk about in the spoiler sections. So, you don't have to, you know, if you, if you don't hate yourself, you don't have to read those user reviews. And yes, so that brings us to IMDB, where it has an overall rating of 6.5 out of 10, based on 193,000 ratings. 24.7 gave it 7, 24.7%. And let's see, 18.9% gave it 6, 16.9 gave it 8. 10 gave 10% 10 gave it 5, 9.5% gave it 10, 7.5 gave it 9, 2.9 gave it 1, 2.8 gave it 3, 1.8 gave it 2. And there are 1,071 IMDb user reviews, or 765 if you <clears throat> don't count spoiler ones. I read the top voted 100, 16 of them gave it a 1 out of 10, 1 gave it a 2, 10 gave it a 3, 4 gave it a 4, 10 gave it a 5, 7 gave it a 6, but 11 gave it a 7, 11, another 11 gave it an 8, 15 gave it a 9, and 25 gave it a 10. So yeah, it is fairly mixed. Some people, some of the most popular reviews written by users on IMDb were ones that absolutely hated it. You know, overall, more were ones that loved it, but it is, yeah. And, yeah, the the special effects, uh, you know, yeah, most of it is practical effects, and, yeah, they do some, some great, like, the makeup is fantastic. Just the, the kind of stuff that, that just absolutely horrifying some of the stuff done to to faces and and human bodies in this and you know yeah you have like yeah body body parts you have a lot of blood but you know some of it's dripping some of it's spraying you know the i think that might be about what i want to say about the special effects without spoiling but yeah really really fantastic I you know it's it's such a relief compared to to some of the other you know yeah I already mentioned there's way too much CG in for example a Nightmare on Elm Street remake and yeah there's also some really solid stunt work and yeah, um, like with movies one and two, this is very much like if you think that there's a chance that gore might be too much for you, you know, yeah, this it, this is definitely a movie where the gore is is too intense for you, and and that's fine, you know, that's you know, recent horror movies do sometimes go extremely far with gore violence and and like thematic elements and you know that's the thing like i i would say this in my opinion i'm not you know you're not wrong if you disagree i found this much scarier than the the others and that's 
you know, I've I've always loved the sense of humor in the the trilogy, but you know, sometimes watching movies two and three, you know, I I do miss the the how scary the first movie was in in those two movies. But you know, that's fair. There's a lot of other movies that that do, you know, that that are that scary. But this one actually does it with Evil Dead, which you know, Evil Dead is inherently a terrifying concept you know that's maybe also part of why Raimi went so comedic with some of it because you know in, in part to alleviate some tension so it doesn't get overpowering you know but but yeah um, there's there's stuff in this that's that's just so much scarier to me than than in the the trilogy so the you know, can't can't speak to every version of the the DVD, but the one I have, the one you might be able to get, has a total of 24 minutes of behind the scenes. It's these three, um, let's see, three three things that are, yeah. There's there's one that's seven minutes, one that's eight minutes, one that's nine minutes, and they're very informational. You learn a lot about how they made the movie. And one of the behind-the-scenes things is the video diary of one of the, the actors, and the actor takes us through the many different things that, you know, that, that this actor has to go through, you know, makeup and prepare, you know, people setting up special effects on her, and she shows, like, molds and, you know, f face molds and, and such. And yeah, you know, they, they talk about the different aspects of production, not, not every single aspect. And you get a good sense of the, you know, yeah, Feta Alvarez and the, the cast in their interviews. And yeah, um, I rate this 10 horror flicks that deliver out of 10. And I absolutely think it holds up. I hope that it'll be liked that in the future, and I definitely do think it deserved a better reception. But yeah, so my ranking of all the Evil Dead official movies, worst to best, though I love them all, 1981 Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness, The Remake, and Rise. Legitimately, I feel like every single movie in this franchise is better than the one... The one that came before it. Not in all ways, but overall. You know, I, I'm not saying that it's funnier. I'm not saying that the, the you know, there's no one as charismatic as, as Bruce Campbell, who has a major role in this. The, you know, it doesn't, the, the hyperkinetic camera work is less, you know, I mean, in, in the in the trilogy, it's practically like overpowering. Like it's it's a it's like a um, carnival ride or something, you know. And this is trying to be much more serious, so it doesn't go anywhere near as far with that. But that brings us to the spoiler section. So, gonna dive right into notes taken while watching so yeah um we open you know i i really love the intro the the fact that like you know you can immediately tell okay this young woman who i guess is phoenix connolly her her character is just teenager i i'm not really seeing anybody else that it makes sense to, yeah, you know, she's, you know, at, at first she, it, it, you know, you can tell from right away, okay, there's something going on, and then we get, like, a close-up of her hand, and there's, like, blood running down her hand, so it's like, okay, this is bad, there's something, you know, but we think that she's the one in danger, you know, so when we see the, the redneck, you know, put a bag over her head, and another, you know, hit her in the in the head with a gun butt, you know, we're thinking, oh, 
you know, I mean, they don't they don't look like they're possessed based on you know you you get a good look at the the faces of these two, and and they are apparently, yeah, they're 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 listed as toothless redneck and long haired redneck. You know, so so we don't we're not completely sure what exactly is going on, and then you know she comes to she's been tied to you know tied up in the you know in the in the cellar, and the more you know she sees a, a man, and then she says, "Daddy," and it's like, "Oh no, she's been fuck me." That's like that's one of the scariest things in the world. You know, because you live with your, you live with your family. You know, imagine one day one of them is like having you kidnapped and and tortured and just you know horrifying. You know, and the the you know and and she starts like trying to appeal to his emotions. You know, she's like, please, daddy, just let me take you know, just take take me away from here. Just hold me like you used to, and it's like. Fuck! Just it's oh, you know, so you know, I, it's just it's like the taunts in the trilogy. Some of them are quite good, uh, you know. The the uh, you know the the there's that one where the um right uh yes. So in case you forgot, since I said at the start of the video, I will be spoiling the entire all, all four of these movies throughout the the rest of this video. But yeah, the the you know, there's one point where one of the possessed is being pulled out of this fireplace, you know, and and the, they say, you know, thank you, I I wouldn't want to have my precious flesh burned or something like that, you know, and the the yeah, you know, there's there's some really good ones for sure, but just like, and I'm again, I'm not blaming. I, I think in in the '80s we weren't ready for something quite as intense as the you know, it would have felt like a, a drama or or you know psychological horror or something but today you can mix those you know and yeah you know she's saying where's mommy and he's like you know you know mommy's dead you know you killed her you did and it's like God, it just it every single every every line of dialogue just makes it so much more horrifying, you know, and the you know and, and you see him unscrewing the thing and it's like that's not apple juice, is it? Fuck, I see where this is going and I don't like it at all. You know, I do. I'm I'm kidding, obviously. And and you know, pour it all over her face and it's like, oh god, oh god. And you know he's he's struggling with the match, and then the you know she she turns back into the the possessed form, and let's see if I can find the the direct quote. Uh, let's see. Mm. Ah, I guess nobody added it. Okay, but but yeah. You know the the yeah she you know to, becomes possessed again and you know says says something horrifying I, f I forget exactly what and you know he manages to to light her on fire and you just see her face burning and her body burning and he gets out the gun and fires at the head freaking blows up why am I saying freaking her head fucking blows up just it's so gnarly so it's Right, and, and throughout this, you know, you have the, the, um, I guess she's not a witch, is she? Uh, let's see, are there, right, she's, she's quoted, uh, the, the, um, credited, she's credited as old woman, you know, she's spurring him on, she's like, you have to do it, you know, and, <laughs> We meet our main cast, and the first thing Mia says, you know, she she sees that David actually showed up, which I appreciate the detail that you know we're told he's two hours late, you know, so it it helps explain, you know, she had maybe 
Except, you know, she she truly believed that he would show up, but now they've been waiting for two hours, and she's like, he's not gonna, he's not gonna fucking show. You know, it's just like back when mom was alive. He just he never shows up when we need him. And then, you know, yeah, she she lifts her head, sees that it's him, and says the words, "I'll be damned," which is a nice little bit of foreshadowing. And. Let's see the yeah and and also the thing with you know cross your heart hope to die. You will. You know if you read ahead in the script you'd know that. And yeah the you know she's she's struggling with the words of the pledge, which is a bad omen. And you know the this is the kind of th you know it implies it doesn't guarantee but it kind of implies that her heart's not completely in it, you know. And, you know, she does dump the the dope, but, yeah. You know, it's it's such a great... I really appreciate that we see that. So, yeah, later, you know, because they all see that. The other four all see that she can't even say the words. You know, it's, it's just words. They, it's, you know, you're not being asked to perform brain surgery. It's not insanely difficult. You know, if, if you need... If you, if you're struggling to remember them, write them down on a piece of paper so you can at least get them right. But you know, she can barely get through them, and yeah, she does dump the dope. But that doesn't have to mean that she's completely dedicated. So you know, that's a, a great yeah. And you know, they yeah. So they enter the cabin, and I appreciate that it's clear that somebody broke in. You know, there's there's the lock, there's the padlock, but you know, there's a there's a crowbar which. You know, will be used, but not to bar crows later on, and yeah, just and and you know, she immediately you know enters and she's like, "What the fuck's that smell?" Or I forget if she says "fuck" right then. She she says "fuck" a lot. You know, once she's in the car, it's like, "Okay, we get it." You're trying to you're trying to outdo, you know, Halloween. It's Rob Zombie's Halloween too, with amount of fucks said but not given in one scene where it's like a, it's yeah it's a car crash in both anyway the the um, yeah you know i appreciate that they wanted this this big reveal later on i don't i think it might have been a mistake to have nobody else able to smell it without any like real like i don't, I don't know uh Yeah, it just it feels like they they should you know there's a there's a term in screenwriting, kill your darlings. They wanted they they loved the idea of all the these dead cats in in the which is also like it it really it's revolting you know so it's a it's a great bit of horror there, but it makes no sense that like she and eventually Grandpa are the only two individuals who can smell that there's anything down there that's wrong. I. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, I guess maybe would it have worked if they just said that somehow they don't give off any smell? I guess that doesn't really make sense. And they wanted the again the revulsion of well once they're down there and say, oh it smells like burnt hair, you know this thing of just yeah. And yeah, Mia says some of the words of, of the lullaby which come back with a vengeance later so very nicely you know good bit of of setup and payoff which you know like the trilogy it's really great at and let's see um what did i write Oh right, right, yeah. Um, Mia and David talk about their their mother, and this thing of you know near the end she couldn't even recognize. You know she thought she mistook Mia for David. You know at one point for an entire day, and and David is like I, I wanted to to come, but I just got the job and didn't seem like there was a good time to to go. And then it was too late, you know. And it is this thing of, you know, you can you can understand where he's coming from, but 
you know, it, it seems like you should have been able to, to visit at least once, at least briefly, and yeah, you know, we, we do get the sense, especially from later in the movie, that he does feel bad about this, you know, and he is trying to make it up to her, trying to make up for it, you know, he he waited too long with his mother. He's not going to wait too long with his sister. So there's a real, like, th throughout the movie, he's completely dedicated. He really badly wants to to do whatever it takes to, to save her. You know, and at first it's from the drugs. Later it's from the demons. Which, yeah, just, it, it hits harder, in my opinion, you know, than... You know, it's it's fine in the in the trilogy, but you know, this was when when he made the trilogy, Sam Raimi wasn't really exploring like really deep emotional connections and and complex relationships. You know, he he later did. He does in stuff like uh, a simple plan. You know, the the relationship between the brothers, for example, is is complex. You know, and there's a lot of history there, but. Yeah, this was the first time an official Evil Dead movie had this much complexity to it, and I don't think that it runs counter to Evil Dead. I think it further deepens the, the terror of it. You know, in, in, in 1981, when the first movie came out, we hadn't seen the kind of gore that that movie has but you know all these years later you know this movie came out let's see what is it I guess 30 32 years later uh, yeah there had been a lot of movies that had that amount of gore so they were trying to to out gross in more ways than one and also add in this the psychological element and I think that the psychological element I don't think it works for every horror movie I think there are some horror movies where it just works better without that kind of thing. But the ones where it works, it can really make it hit so much harder, as is the case here. And... Let's see... Yeah, and, you know, they talk about, we can't let Mia leave. You know, she legally died, which, you know... I guess it's worse than illegally dying. It's just, I don't know, it's a weird phrase to me. Legally died, whatever. But, but yeah, you know, the, the, I guess it's, if he just said she literally died, it might be like, oh, you're exaggerating. But, yeah. And, yeah, you know, she had to be defibrillated, which, nice bit of setup for the later payoff. And... Yeah, and, you know, eventually she said, you know, I can't stand that smell anymore. And Grandpa found the cellar door, and finally the others take it seriously. I, you know, I do appreciate, you know, there's a visual reason for, you know, and, and you can also see Grandpa is not having it. Like, he is, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and guess male based on them calling him Grandpa, not Grandma. You know, he's he's like, you know, biting at it and like scratching at, you know, there's, okay, there's something there. And he is not a fan, and yeah, that's the kind of thing you investigate, obviously. And, you know, once they get the cover off the, the cellar door, there's like a trail of blood, which, yeah, that's a much more logical explanation for why you would go into the cellar than, you know, oh, it like blasted open, like in, in the other movies, which, again... I appreciate, you know, there's there's some satire there. It's young people doing stupid things for a horror movie to happen. You know, that's a, that's a trope. And it was, you know, Raimi was making fun of it way before anyone else was. At least in, in a fairly straight horror film. You know, but, no, I, I do really appreciate it. And that's another, you know, the fact that Mia is, you know, going through withdrawal... Yeah, they don't believe her when she says there's something out there, which you know they they don't they don't see it. You know, it's it's not like she's saying something that they can see, 
and you know at one point like you know she's saying I think it's in here with us now and David's like in here with with me you know and it you know he's he's trying to be nice and he's trying to be sympathetic but he's like I mean I don't I don't see anything I don't hear or smell there's n Mia there's nothing in here you know you're here I'm here nothing else is in here so so you know when you know yeah in in some of the others uh, you know it's they're they're taking it remarkably well that that something really obviously did happen that you know cuz like yeah if someone who's going through withdrawal runs into the woods then you find her and you know yeah she's like babbling on about you know yeah she's she's talking about oh the the woods came alive and attacked me you know yeah you're not going to believe that you're going to think you know it's it's only later that it becomes clear that there's something more going on and yeah um yeah they they go into the basement they find the book i love the way that the camera like it places the book right in the center and then it like turns on an angle it's i mean it's not quite 180 maybe it's about 90 degree angle turn as various, you know, Eric is sitting in front of it and Mia is like pacing around, you know, and just because the book is, you know, they can't help but wonder about the book. So it's very, very nicely done. And it feels like the kind of thing that Raimi himself would, would make, would do with the camera. And yeah, the, we see Eric examining the, the book and I appreciate that it was a way for them to get in some references. You know, you have Ash's cut off hand doing, you know, flip flipping off. I don't think it really, it, it does not really fit. You know, I get it. I 100% I understand. But yeah. Um, and I think some of the warnings written in English work, like the, you know, don't. Don't say it, don't read it, don't hear it. You know, that's very effective. But then at one point, it just says, like, kill, kill, kill. And one says, like, kill the bitch or something like that. And it just feels like, okay, we get it. You're, you're using grown-up words. It's, you know, you're, you're, you're very edgy. Now, just, yeah. But the, I, I do really appreciate, like, it's, it's, like, wrapped in, in, I guess it's like a it's like a garbage bag or something, and it's like t you know around that you've got like barbed wire tire. You know, it's there there. You know, someone went to a lot of effort to make sure that no one read from this book. You know, and yeah, you know, Eric being a teacher is curious, and you know the the thing to cut open. Um, barbed wire, you know, yeah, they have a tool shed, uh, you know, I already mentioned in the review, I don't think it really made sense that it was him who read from the book, like, I can, I can, I'm willing to go as far as, you know, oh, he, like, he does the, the thing with the pencil to uncover what was written there and was, like, and they tried to hide it, but, you know, just have it be that and, like, maybe, you know, he leaves the book there and, like, goes off to, to tell one of the others, you've got to see what's in this book, you know, and, and by the time he comes back, he sees that, that Mia is, has just gotten to the end of reading aloud the thing, and he's like, no, you, you can't read it, you know, and, and tries to close the book, but she, she just barely finishes it, and then maybe, like, she, she, laughs in a in a really you know and and she's like I guess you have to take me back don't you or something like that you know take, take me back to the city in the summer in the city but the oh wrong piece of paper I did think that was a bit of a, a jump but but yeah uh, very cool as always I I always love the the POV of the evil spirit you know yeah, coming closer and closer, and yeah, they they don't disappoint.
and let's see. Yeah, and you know, Mia is talking about, you know, you have to take me home. At least one person sees her wandering around out in the rain. I I've watched this movie three times. I cannot figure out why no one goes out and, and like says, Come on, you gotta you gotta come in. You're gonna catch cold, you know. It just Yeah. And you know, this is after they've started getting rid of all the the dead cats. So, you know, I could appreciate I yeah, I guess the, it it is probably the smell that gets her out there, which is also like it's never again, it's satirical, so it doesn't have to make sense. It's it's making fun of how little sense it makes. But I appreciate that this one didn't go with, oh, you know, she heard something weird from the forest, so she goes out by herself to to investigate, you know, it doesn't yeah. Now the but but yeah you know she she uh, let's see she, yeah she she tells them you know you have to take me home and you know Olivia says you know we we've we've talked about it and we we can't take you home and you know Eric adds you know we we can't lose you again and then cuts to Natalie and it looks like she might have a line but nope. Because they deleted all her lines, and it's like, I guess she's at least in the scene. That's better than nothing. And, yeah, you know, she she gets in the car in the first of many times in this movie where they don't carefully watch someone that they think is being irrational in some way and don't make sure that she can't, you know, that, that this person can't doesn't have access to something dangerous. And yeah, you know, she's she's in the car saying fuck over and over and crashes the car because of the the possessed Mia and you know it goes in in the water which helps explain, you know, later there's only the one car they can take. And it is this thing of you know, yeah, they they came in separate cars. That's why you have the, the weight and, you know, yeah, in, in the other movies, the, the car does go through, which, let's see, I feel, I, I read that this is, it's very similar, but it's not the exact same car because the, the actual car from the trilogy was being used in Oz the Great and Powerful, which Sam Raimi was directing around the same time. You know, both movies came out in 2013. You know, but they, they put in effort to try to find one that was as similar as they possibly could. And, yeah, you know, you have this thing of the, the you know, in the second movie, there is, like, a car chase involving, you know, yeah, driving away from the POV chasing the, the car. And so here, instead, you know, the... the yeah, the spirit tricks, you know, yeah, tricks her into crashing the car so she can't get away. And later it's rained too much. And, uh, yeah, so I have things to say about the, the rape, the tree rape. Um, yeah, I've written some things in my notes for the next section, so I'll talk about it when I... Yes. When I, when I get there. The the one thing I'll say here that I had forgotten to note in the other one, the the glob that gets vomited out and, and, you know, penetrates, when it's coming out of Possessed Mia's mouth, it is not particularly convincing CG. It's one of the few bits of, of that. And... Yeah, you know, she's not able to leave and we get the the whisper scene which I do legitimately think um, let's see. yeah the you know let's see Mia saying you know David please please you have to get me out of here no you don't understand there was something in the woods David and I think it's in here with us now you know just yeah, very, very creepy, and, yeah, great performance. And, let's see, then we have the... 
yeah, Eric, you know, your, your friend down there. I have no idea who you're talking about. Wow. And the dog isn't moving, and we get a brief flashback of her beating it to death with a hammer. And that's, again, like, fuck. Animal cruelty, that'll get you. That'll really... And I, I appreciate, I respect people who say that's going too far. That there should never be cruelty to animals. Even, like, you know, obviously they didn't... You know, it's it's fake. They didn't actually hurt an animal for the, the movie. But even just de depicting it like that, you know, I can appreciate that that's going too far for, for some... Um, right, and apparently, like, it, it sort of whimpers from down there, and that was apparently not in the script. Like, someone from the studio, you know, made them add that, even though there's no, like, is the only bit of setup that there's no payoff to, because we never actually see the dog again. Like, the rest of the movie proceeds as if the whimpering was not there, because, yeah, the dog is dead in, in the script. And... Yeah, it's just studio people, man. They really have no idea what they're doing a lot of the time. Let's see. Yeah, and you, you know, we have the the shower, which, you know, it's a good way to, to relax. A nice, hot, scalding shower leading to second and third degree burns. And it is like, you know, the... When when David gets in there and you just see the the you know just ugh so nasty on the the burns on her face just Jesus and yeah David tries to to get her out of there but he cannot cross the bridge under troubled water and yeah they talk about you know these are like second or third degree burns this is you know it's is a big problem and and Natalie actually gets a line which is which is nice and Mia got the gun which yeah I I'm not gonna claim that it makes any sense for them to not make sure that the person who is so irrational that she's like boiled herself on purpose you know that they're not making sure she doesn't get her hands on the gun which they know is there, you know, this is like a, a family thing, and they, they found the gun earlier, and they weren't like, who the fuck put a gun here? Like, you know, evidently that's just supposed to be there, so they know it's there, and they don't do anything about it. Just, yeah. Let's see, and... And Mia vomits directly onto the face, into the mouth of Olivia, which... You know, Jane Levy, the actress playing Mia, said in one of the behind the scenes, you know, that was the worst thing I had to do. I'm going to hell for that, which, yeah. And, you know, yeah, wouldn't be an Evil Dead movie without someone, without something nasty getting spewed in someone's face. And... Let's see. You know, so so yeah, we've seen that sort of thing many times before in in these in these movies, but this was the one that most felt like incredibly disgusting. And yeah, you know, they talk about we gotta, you know, Olivia at first is not crazy about giving Mia more sedatives. You know, it could put her into a coma. Which is absolutely true. If you if you give someone too many sedatives, it can put them in a coma. And you know, yeah, they insist. So she goes into the the bathroom. You know, f flicks the light switch. Which how is there electricity in the cabin after all this time? And and just you know, it it kind of feels like the evident. You know, clearly they haven't been here for a while. But, like, yeah, there's still functioning electricity after all this time. And, and you know, just, yeah. Anyway, you know, and, and we get the classic, you know, it's we've seen in a, in a lot of horror movies. You know, someone will open the, um, you know, the, the medicine cabinet or whatever it's called, you know, and close it. And there's, you know, in the reflection, there's like there's someone behind them or something, you know. But this time it's her own reflection and it's the cut up face, which, okay, so the the scolding and the cut up face, those are ways to try to 
remove the demon, according to the book. But it kind of felt like it's just some of the, the demons trying to mutilate their hosts, which, you know, they, they do across all of these movies. So, yeah, I, I don't... You know, even I guess that's why they keep cutting to like this was something some user reviewers really hated. It'll you know right before or as something you know really fucked up is happening with the possessed, it'll cut to to a page of the book that that shows a, a depiction of someone doing that. You know, and yeah, I guess it's to to help explain this. I didn't think that it like ruined the movie, which other people thought. I don't think it's necessary, but it is also... I, I don't know that I love this idea of... Because it never actually seems to work. Like, I just feel like it, if you're going to do that sort of thing, it has to be because they're prevented from completing it. I mean, I guess... I guess Mia... Okay, I can see Mia being prevented from finishing the scolding. But it didn't seem like Olivia was being prevented from from carving up her face to to or I guess maybe the the demon opened the door so that Eric could come in and stop her. But the demon also closed the door so she couldn't escape, and then she starts carving. I I think it was a mistake. I think it should have just been oh this is what the demons do. The the demons mutilate not only the bodies of those who are not possessed, but also themselves. And, but, but yeah, you know, she, yeah, she sees the, the fucked up face in the mirror, and the mirror shards break, and, you know, in Army of Darkness, mirror shards break, and mini ashes pop out, and do the, you know, tie him up like Lilliputians and Gulliver's Travels and, and shit. But here, it's like, oh, you know, pick up the, you know, do a little bit of impromptu amateur plastic surgery. Doesn't work out quite as well as she'd hoped. You know, but but yeah, I appreciate it. Because it is, you know, over the course of the trilogy, each of them has a mirror scene. And gradually, it becomes more and more, like, aggressive. And the, the other Ash, the demonic Ash you know, it gets more and more, like, harsh with him. But here, you know, the, the, this different take of, of, like, carving up a face with, with shards of a mirror, which is also the kind of thing, you know, you couldn't really do that back when they were making the, the trilogy. But, yeah, today you can, and you can actually get that past censors. And... Let's see the um, uh, right, yeah, and and you know Eric gets in there and catches her. Why the fuck would you do that to yourself? And you know slips on part of her face meat, and you know falls, and she starts like stabbing him in the fucking face with the needle, and which she was, you know. That she was standing there preparing, so you know we know exactly where it came from, and you know the the hand, and like at one point he like pulls out like a, a needle from the God, that's so fucked up. I love it, and you know yeah he he manages to to get the the, the heavy thing and just keeps bashing her her face in, and it's like this you know you like. You can identify her body. He fucked up her face so bad. I don't. I'm not sure you could even like identify by by teeth, or your dental records or something. Like you, yeah, you'd have to, you'd have to like do blood tests to to identify. Cause fuck, that's that's so fucked up. I love it, and you know the the that I, I suppose if I had to one thing. I think it would have been cool if Possessed Olivia had been all around for a little longer. Because she really doesn't get to be around or do very much. Be around for very long or do very much. And and that's that's one. Because it's such a cool setup. Such a, you know, yeah. 
you know, absolutely love the the makeup on that. Just incredibly convincing and and off putting. And yeah, love the three sixty degree shot after the cellar door opens, and Natalie is pulled in, and the you know, and and yeah, she's like, okay, uh, I gotta I gotta fight her off here. Exacto knife, you know. Don't come any closer. I'll, you know, and and Mia gets the knife, and you know, extends it further, and then just like cuts her fucking tongue in half, and and like at one point, like her eyes are like, you know, and and just and and like she's yeah, she's swilling her tongue around to to make sure like. Oh, she feels it. It's not that, oh, you know, I guess she's doing this because she just can't feel how much... It, no, no, she feels it. She's, you know, demonic possessed Mia is super into it. Just, yeah, so fucked up. And... Let's see... Yeah, and you get the, the line, you know... Yeah, David, you know, says, Mia... And, you know, she responds, Mia's not here, you fucking idiot. Your little sister's being raped in hell. Which, you know, I know some people feel is too, you know, in general, the, the possessed in this are too similar to, like, the exorcist possession kind of stuff. I do really think that it's, maybe it's just me. To me, being raped in hell hits so much harder than sucks cocks in hell. I've I've always, like... Since the very first time I heard that, I was like, I mean, I, okay, so it's hell, so I guess she's being forced, but, like, because, because, like, you know, sucking cock by itself, is that supposed to be a bad thing? I, I guess they think of it as, like, a demeaning thing, but it just, I, I've never thought that that really worked as a, you know... Just, and, and it's so, just, it's so easy to rewrite to, to, you know, even if, you know, maybe in the first Exorcist, maybe they didn't want to use the word rape, but at least have the word force in there, you know, yeah, let's see, what is the line? Your mother sucks cocks in hell, I think. Your mother is forced to suck cocks in hell. You know, there you go, but just from, like... I mean, I guess it would bother him because he doesn't like to think of his mother as a sexual being, but it's just like, I don't know. I, I guess back then, no, no, because it was like, even back then, like, blowjobs were thought of just, I, I, you know, maybe it wasn't seen as, like, today there's a lot of young men who just, you know, expect the, the woman they're with to, to perform oral. But, I mean, even back then it wasn't, yeah, I, I never, I've never thought that really completely worked. Not really a fan of The Exorcist. Anyway, let's see the... Yeah, and we see, you know, Eric is trying to burn the book, and it's just not... It, it, it does not burn, which is legitimately, you know, that's a great... Because, because again, you know, in in the first movie, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing, in the first movie, the solution was to burn the book. You know, that gets rid of all the the possessed. Although Ash does end up possessed at the very very end, but you know, so so you know, we're thinking, oh, it's going to end with burning the book again. You know, which is also you know, in the second movie, the book just never reappears, and some people thought that the book hadn't been burned even though they specifically mentioned that the the missing pages are all that's left. Anyway, but yeah, you know, so yeah, oh, it's going to end with them burning the book. Nope, it is absolutely not going to, you know, it. you can't even burn the book. And holy shit, the, the wound on the hand, you know, so, you know, she gets she gets bitten on the on the hand. Let's see, that, ah, crap, that, yeah, you know, and, and just... Yeah, and she's like, you know, holding it underwater, and she's like squeezing it, and this nasty black stuff is like pouring out. It's just, oh, so gross. Absolutely love it. And, you know, once the hand starts becoming possessed, it gets that kind of 
really fucked up. Like the flesh looks completely all, you know, I guess like rotting almost, you know. And, you know, it's it's moving weirdly. You know, I feel like that's got to be a reference to, to Ash versus his hand. And I'm really glad that they didn't try to, like, if... Natalie's hand had started like smashing plates over her head. It would have been like, okay, this is not working at all, you know. And yeah, you know, it spreads up the entire arm. So she cuts off the arm with the the um what's it called? The um Yeah, I you know, the electrical cutter thing, you know, and and you know, Mia is, is, you know, telling her not to, and see, yeah, and, and, you know, she says, I had to do it, I feel much better now, and then, you know, the arm falls off, just, yeah, and, you know, the, David says, everything's gonna be fine, and Eric's like, she just cut her fucking arm off, does that sound fine, which, you know, very similar to, to what Mirror Ash says, you know, does that sound fine? And let's see. Yeah, you know, and, and Eric explains to David, you know, why it is necessary for him to, to kill his own sibling, which, you know, it's a lot of siblings who don't need a motive. And... Yeah, love the bit with the nail gun. Fuck, you know, just and it, the the you know we see it like raised and starts firing and like holding up and it goes through hand, goes through arm and just oh, and into face, just so just yeah. And the the crowbar which splits one hand, it's one it hit, just yeah. And. Yeah, and the gun is used to to shoot off the the hand, and we get some some kind of fake looking CG blood, you know, spurting and, and pouring when the its arm is is held downwards, kind of thing. You know, that was yeah, kind of obvious. And then we get the lullaby again, just as you know, he's he's trying to to burn the and and then we hear this the lullaby and they they did a good job like apparently they wrote the lullaby specifically for the movie and it is the kind of thing that just you know if you heard if if a mother is singing it to her baby yeah it sounds like comforting which already puts it above the the you know I would say the hush little baby don't you cry I think it is you know I always appreciated the the Simpsons, you know, animating like if the baby actually understands the words and imagines it happening, you know. But yeah, but it's one of those things where you know back then they wrote really dark lullabies as a sort of way to like ward off, you know, to make sure it doesn't happen. You're singing it, kind of thing. Anyway, but but yeah, it sounds the lullaby in this movie sounds like a comforting thing if it's a mother singing to her baby. But when it's like a possessed person singing to non-possessed family member, yeah, very, very creepy, very effective. And we get a very clearly Sam Raimi-inspired montage of him, you know, f making a sort of defibrillating thing, which, you know, yeah, I mean, he's a mechanic, so... And and the you know some of what he uses for the defibrillator is like the um, these these syringes with with metal needles and metal does conduct electricity and what a defibrillator you know the thing that makes it work is that it transmits a lot of electricity into the the heart so yeah like hypothetically it, it makes sense what he's doing. And yeah, so here near the end, you know, the the one of the only survivors goes to the cellar in order to fix things, which yeah, you know, wouldn't be an Evil Dead movie that has a, a cabin and a cellar without that. And I think I can 
you know, overall, so in the in Evil Dead 2, you know, it's the it's the missing pages that need to be dealt with. You know, in, in Army of Darkness, it's the, the books and the siege. And then here, you know, he has to pick up the possessed Mia. And, you know, not long after, Mia fights the Abomination, which I, I, I feel like there should have been more set up for, you know, it, it feels like they're trying to do the Evil Dead 2 thing of the physical embodiment of it. And I'm not saying there's zero setup. I, I think it could have been a little stronger. And you also have this thing of, you know, oh, if, what was it, five souls get, you know, transferred, then the abomination will rise. And, you know, you have people arguing, well, was, how did they get to five? You know, wait, does the teenager from the start count? Because she was, like, burned, like, they were trying to make sure that it didn't get, you know. So it's a little unfortunate with, with that kind of thing. Love the fight in the the cellar, and the burial, which like, okay, the I'm just gonna yeah some thankfully and does make a lot of sense. Someone did indeed add the 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 exchange to IMDb memorable quotes. You know he's he's like you know in the process of of burying her and you know she comes to and she's like I can't breathe and because because the plastic bag you know I can't move and he's like you know I know you're possessed you know stop it and then she changes tactics and says why do you hate me David I know you do you left home you left me all alone with our sick mother and I was just a kid you made me lie every time she screamed your name I told her you were coming to see her like you promised, but you never did. I know you. I know Mother hates you now, and she waits for you in hell. And it's like, fuck! It's just, it's such. Oh God, you know, just really, really gets to you. It's, it's, it's so much more effective in my opinion than than the the, you know, more like kind of ridiculous taunts of the of the trilogy. Again, I'm not saying that the trilogy could have... You know, the trilogy laid the groundwork. And I do still love the trilogy. And, yeah, so he uses the the defibrillator and does, you know, manage to, to bring her back to life. And, yeah, David and Eric fight and we get the blood rain. And I quite like that, you know, when the abomination comes out, that's actually, you know, it looks very much like the cover of the original Evil Dead. And that hadn't actually been in one of these movies until this point. Which, you know, and it's a neat little thing because the cover for Evil Dead 2 is sort of in Army of Darkness. That, you know, the, the like, skeletons, uh, yeah, skull with, with eyes. Yeah, that's Evil Ash at the end of the movie, you know, after... The, the flesh burns, you know, yeah, near the very, very end, and, you know, the, the, yeah, some of the stuff in the cover from Army of Darkness is in Army of Darkness, but the, the, yeah, they hadn't done the hand that comes out of the ground in front, which, you know, yeah, by this point, you know, they had the, the money to, to be able to arrange for, because it is essentially, yeah, if you have the money, it's easy enough. You just, you know, you, yeah, you dig the hole, you get someone down there who doesn't mind being partially buried like that, and, you know, have a, have a cue, time it right, and the hand comes out, you know, kind of just, yeah. Um, let's see, and the, yeah, and yeah, she gets the, the saw and the abomination starts attacking using the machete and you know first like she's in this this very narrow place and like the machete comes through and then goes out and then it starts actually going through the wall in places that hurt like so it's like cutting you know at one point like stabs her a little and then you know not in the face but stabs her at one point it like cuts through the top of her leg and then gets pulled out, cutting more, just, oh, so, it just looks so painful. 
and yeah, you know, she's the, the, let's see, she's, yeah, she's like hiding under the car, and the abomination gets there, and she, you know, she struggles with it, because this is an American movie, and either a car or a chainsaw has to struggle to start, if there is a scene where it needs to be used, and she manages to get it, and she saws, like, a, a leg off the, the thing, just very, very cool, and the abomination, like, is knocking over the car, and she, like, barely gets out of the way, and rolls out, you know, and her hand does get, like, caught under it, and she has to pull until it gets, you know, very, very cool. And it's, you know, so, so yeah, earlier we had uh, the entire arm sawed off, which, yeah, like, the hand being sawed off in the, you know, that is, again, you know, building on it and making it bigger. Sawing off a hand versus sawing off the entire arm. And then here, you know, th and another hand goes off, but this time it's somewhat reminiscent of in the first movie when one of them, like, bites their own hand, one of the possessed bites their own hand off. Let's see, and yeah, you know, she saws the abomination in half, like bisecting it, which, I'm not gonna lie, that was something, you know, the first time I watched Evil Dead 2, and it looked like that's where they were going, and then they didn't go there. I, yeah, that's something I've, I've wanted to see in one of these. And that is, those were the notes made while watching, so that brings us to the ones, let's see, there we go, notes taken before watching. So, let's see, the, um, yes, so, the tree rape is completely unnecessary, it's 100% within the logic of the movie for her to simply be infected by, say, being, say, stabbed, or had fluid shot in, onto her, into her, by the woods, that's all, it, you know, in, into her mouth or something, or into a wound, that's all it takes for the other people, and, you know, the original, in, in the original film, apparently, at first, Sam Raimi was not planning on having tree rape, but it was suggested, he had agreed, and he has since admitted it was a mistake. To be clear, I'm not saying that no movie can ever depict the act of rape. Among my favorite movies are 2003's Monster, but that's a movie that actually explores the after-effects of rape. It doesn't just use it to shock the audience. This movie does not explore the impact it has, the way she reacts. It seems more like those scenes, you know, yeah, it, it feels like she's reacting to being, you know, attacked by something, you know, f physically attacked, which does not have the same kind of trauma effect. You know, any professional will tell you this. Uh, sexual assault has a different trauma effect on a human being than physical assault. And, you know, yeah, I honestly, I feel like the the um, it would probably have been perfectly... I don't, I, you know, I don't know Feta Alvarez, certainly he did some really fucked up stuff to the actors in this, so, you know, maybe it would otherwise, but it almost feels to me like it's there because the movie does a lot of what happens in the original, and, and takes some stuff from the two sequels. Now, I appreciate that we don't see Mia herself look possessed, only the twin, until around the halfway point of the movie, and that's also when she really starts acting possessed, and then the movie really hits the gas for the rest of it, after the first third is very much set up. I love that the movie doesn't feel like it's just going through a checklist, but it really does manage to fit in every gross, gnarly, scary thing that it can, given the setting, you know. Obviously, they wouldn't be able to do a liquid nitrogen head smash. Yes, that's one of the few things I really appreciate about the movie that I am referring to that has that. I don't know that I want to give it away for those who haven't watched that movie, but yeah, if you know, you know. And the amount of characters, you know, no massive army of zombies like Army of Darkness. Basically everything that is messed up to see. Nails penetrating skin and probably bone from being shot at you. Also a machete cutting through part of your leg. Shotgun blast that completely blow up a head. Feeling compelled to cut yourself in a way that will never heal. Or if the thing that freaks you out is losing limbs, cut, all, cut one of your arms off 
And then it turns out it didn't matter. She still ends up possessed, ripping one's own hand off, burning, scalding yourself. Someone almost drowns. Someone suffocates to death in a plastic bag, being raped, being locked up, being forced to kill someone close to you, such as your own mother, uh, yeah, yeah, your own mother, your childhood pet, your daughter, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. V uh, yeah, killing your own daughter via burning, being physically and socially isolated, drug withdrawal through cold turkey, the people closest to you not believing you when you're describing the horror you're going through. Like, essentially, you know, at the risk of... No, I don't think this is misusing... <laughs> Shit. I guess tech... Okay. No, I guess technically it isn't gaslighting, because I believe gaslighting means that the other person knows that what they're saying isn't true and they do believe that what they're saying is is true but yeah you know it's still it's horrifying not to be believed by the the people around you and you know some of that stuff is in some of the earlier movies certainly not all of it and yeah i just it to me it does not hit as hard in those movies as it does here like the 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 fact that she knows and we the audience know what's going on but nobody believes her is really really it's terrifying there's even a conversation between at least two people face to face they manage to cause grievous bodily harm to literally every section of the human body head to toe we've got head heads being blown off getting shot with nail guns got torso stabbing arms and hands cut or crushed off at least one guy gets nailed in the leg you know no part of the human body and no tool within the tool shed is off limits and that's again you know yeah in the others you know yeah you've got the chains again not saying the others are not amazing but you you know you've got the chainsaw in this chainsaw nail gun the the um what's it? I, electrical slicing thing i i I don't own one, so I have no idea what it's called. Uh, you know, the the uh, crowbar, you know, all these things. And I love the way the film goes bigger than 1 and 2 because it can and it's effective. You know, so, yeah, in the original movie in 81, 1981, Evil Dead, the book burns. In this one, the cabin burns, you know, and... The, the yeah already mentioned you know in the in Evil Dead Two the chainsaw touches the top of the neck of Linda, and in this the abomination is bisected, and this is also the first of the four where the book is not destroyed on or off screen, and just as capable of evil at the end as at the start. I really love that the book cannot be burned at the end of the movie has not been destroyed. Maybe it's impossible. You know, it was bound in barbed wire. They, like, the people who knew what it could do, you know, covered it as much as they could, bound in barbed wire. They didn't burn it, which kind of implies that they couldn't, because we know that they were willing to burn. They were willing to burn that teenage girl. They probably tried burning the book, and it did not work. Uh, which, again, just, it's, it's, really really scary when you think you know how to address something you know evil and dangerous and it just doesn't work i love that this one does try to logically reason why the characters don't believe the woman saying that the forest attacked her she saw something mysterious in the woods that don't doesn't make any sense she's going through withdrawal maybe she hallucinated and maybe she's lying so they'll take her away from there haha <laughs> ho ho he he this is exactly how most of us re would react in this situation, which makes it all the scarier. Like, you find yourself thinking, wait, fuck, am I capable of doing something that would, you know, cause some, you know, cause a lot of terror and, and anxiety in someone I love? You know, that's so much scarier than, than so many... There's a lot of things in horror movies that are not as scary as that, in my opinion. The basement belonged to a real alpha male. He murdered so much pussy, and he put his trophies on display. And let's see. When David has to unbury Mia, they did actually bury actress Jane Levy, who plays Mia. They did, of course, have safeguards to make sure she wouldn't suffocate, but it's still a pretty messed up thing to do. 
I think Alvarez wanted to top even Sam Raimi's torture of his cast, and certainly that is a significant attempt that um, what we uh, what we actually see when she is unburied. You know, behind the scenes, Jane. Um, ah, right. I missed that. Hold on. Yes, that is a significant attempt at that. We actually do see when she's unburied and behind the scenes stuff, and Jane Levy just casually asks, Can I come out now? And yeah, so the. Let's see. Right. Um, one person says that the the one one so yeah back to back to user reviews that yeah one person um yeah i'll just i'll just read this fresh new take on the original story did have some striking similarities to the first two movies that there were parts that deviated far perhaps too far i am of course talking about who ends up with a chopped off hand the chainsaw and walking away as the sole survivor here and no, I'm not going to ruin it by saying who it was. However, I will say that this twist and turn from the original story didn't sit well in my stomach. Can someone check on this person? I don't think they're okay. Like, it's fine to not like Mia as much as Bruce Campbell's Ash, but did not sit well in your stomach. Like, Ash is still out there. Like, this movie doesn't claim that Ash is... And even if he wasn't, that's going really far. Anyway... So, yeah, the Abomination and Possessed Mia remind sir, some user readers of Asian horror, like The Ring and The Grudge. They think that's bad. Um, I mean, I, I can somewhat see it. I, I don't feel like it's a direct, like, you don't have the, like, really long, you know, dark hair. The I, I, I don't know. To me, it's just not, you know... With, without that, it's not quite the, the same. That's one of the most striking aspects of the, you know. But, but yeah, I, I acknowledge that in some ways they, the, there's a visual similarity. I don't think it's a bad thing, but I appreciate some people d don't like that. and I don't think that's wrong or something. Um, let's see. Yeah, um... Some say the demonic possession here feels more like something out of The Exorcist than Evil Dead, and that's another. Again, you know, some people, some people really don't like that. I thought it was fine. Um, I mean, we have three movies where the Evil Dead look one specific way. I, I thought it made sense to to change. And though I don't like The Exorcist, and I haven't, I probably won't watch any of the sequels. I was fine with that. You know, I, I can appreciate that it wouldn't maybe have been nice if it was slightly more original. And, uh, yeah, one person doesn't like that there's a face to the evil presence. They thought it worked better when the evil presence was shown with camera work and practical effects. And yeah, that's a matter of opinion. I love the way they did it in the other movies. I think what they do here works really well in this movie. And let's see. Um, right, and one person said, if the appearance of objects such as the chainsaw and shotgun were only going to really act as callbacks to the old film, then it seemed somewhat pointless. I mean, they're not just callbacks. I, I, again, I don't even know what this person means. I guess, are they saying that it feels like they're in this movie primarily because they were in those other movies? I mean, I could see, certainly it, it does appear that that might be the case, but like, the chainsaw and shotgun save the day. The shotgun is how... David is able to stop Eric at the end when he shoots the 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 gas canister. The chainsaw is how Mia is able to to take out the abomination. 
you know, so, like, they have more of a point than, you know, ultimately the chainsaw makes a brief appearance but isn't actually used in the first movie, so, which again, I'm not saying is, is bad, but kind of felt like this did more with that. I agree that if the chainsaw had just been seen and never used, then it, you know, that wouldn't have been super interesting, but, yeah. Um, let's see. I don't even want to read this aloud. It's just, there's some, there's someone who whines about how, you know, the, the, okay. I'll just, I'll, a couple of co choice quotes. He says that the thing that made the original awesome was that it was a male hero. I, I love Ash. Bruce Campbell is awesome, but there's a million things on that, that are higher on the list for me that make the, the trilogy awesome than, than, than the fact that the hero is male. Like, I, I agree if we're talking about, you know, okay, we love Ash. It's great that he's there, but if he hadn't been the, the, hero and main survivor of, of the movies of the trilogy, although I suppose it's debatable whether he technically survives the first, if you only watch that one. I thought it would have been fine if it had been one of the, the women, and, you know, yeah, then he, you know, he says, oh, you know, why does, let's see, yeah, he, he doesn't like that it's a final girl in this movie when, in a lot of horror movies, it's... It, yeah, when, when Ash is one of the rare, you know, exceptions, usually it is a, a final girl. But horror, you know, back to me, horror is the rare genre where the lead is a woman, except for the genre of rom-com, which a lot of men don't respect. You know, so... No, I, you know, it's fine to, you know, if you don't like Mia, that's fine. If you, you know, but to get upset that it's a, that the movie has a final girl when it's just, if, if there were more movies where women were, you know, actually treated with respect by the movie and characters, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily keep being a big deal for them to keep having that but the the you know and I love that this guy actually says now the movie is just like every other horror film ever and who wants to see the same thing over and over but almost all like it's a very statistically insignificant amount of American movies where the main focus is on a woman and not a man and I don't I I wouldn't say that the movie is primarily like the the thing with Mia she's the she is the the no never mind um you know the the yeah I've, I've said everything that I want. Yeah, and I've seen some say that the characters are just there to be killed off, forgetting that the second movie very much showed this was the case with the first one, since the recap cuts out three characters. Things largely happen the same way, despite... Yeah, despite this. And I would also definitely say that throughout the trilogy, it is very much the case that the characters are largely there, so there's a lot of them that can be possessed and killed off, and, and that kind of thing, and... Uh, right, I've seen some claim that this movie was predictable. They knew who would die when and how. I find that very hard to believe. I was surprised many times throughout it, and I've been watching horror movies since I was 13. I've watched probably over 100 horror movies. Now, let's see. And and if we're talking, like, from around this same time, probably at least a dozen 2010s, late 2000s horror movies. Now, let's see. You know, th this was one, you know, like I said in the review, I actually cared about the characters here. Very much not the case in the, the, yeah, you know, they're, they're, other than Ash, I, I don't 
really care about the the characters in in any of the movies. Like there's just barely enough there that we understand who they are and why they're doing what they're doing. And there's certainly, you know, we hate uh, I always forget his name. Jake, I think is his name, the the hick who's obsessing over Bobby Joe. You know, he's really obnoxious, but other than that, I don't really care about them as as characters. Like if you swapped around a bunch of characters, it wouldn't really matter in the trilogy. And, yeah, one person criticized, you know, after Mia has been possessed, when she comes back, all the injuries are gone. That's pretty much always been the case in all the movies that came before this one. Like, Henrietta grows back her eye when she reverts to her original human form. You know, the, like, like sure, like, body parts don't grow back, but that also doesn't, like, the only thing is, like, her tongue has healed. You know, the, the burns are gone and that kind of thing. But, like, yeah, um, let's see, yeah, that is it for this one. So, thank you for celebrating Spooktober with me, and, yeah, more horror reviews are forthcoming. I don't only do it, you know, October is the one month a year I dedicate entirely to horror. But, you know, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, I do a weekly video on a horror thing, you know. So, anyway, um, yes, let me know in the comments section, you know, do you have any suggestions for things that should have been changed or things you thought were especially great about this one that I haven't already covered? If you like the video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. I do a weekly video talking about a horror thing. Uh, I try to do a daily. It doesn't always end up being every single day video on a Marvel TV show usually the ones that are more or less in continuity with the MCU. Um, let's see. I do a... Right, and, and I'm also covering, you know, Loki. Each episode as it comes out, and I will continue to do that for future MCU shows that are on Disney+, Plus, as well as Star Wars shows and other content that are on Disney Plus and yes recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one in other words if more of it is like this you're luck you can check out my back catalog as we'll catch me next week I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording I'll catch you next time feast on this <laughs>